Thank you, everyone, for sticking around here for the last panel of the day. Uh, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, my name is Sam Bish. I am the Interim Director of Technology Advancement and also the Senior Licensing Associate uh, for the Life Sciences Unit within the Office of, Tech, or of Technology Advancement Office. And so today, the title of our panel is Building Economic Impact from University Research Through Effective Industry Partnerships. Uh, and so before we begin, though, you see their faces and their titles on the, the board here, but I'm just going to let the panelists introduce themselves real quickly so that you know who you're speaking with today. Thanks, Sam. My name is Luke Heim. I'm a Strategic Outsourcing Director at Corteva AgriSciences. It's probably a name that many of you don't recognize because Corteva is the new ag business that's formed out of the merger of Dow AgroSciences and DuPont Crop Protection. That also includes the seed business of Pioneer. Um, I've been with Heritage Dow for 20 years, a graduate of Mizzou in biochemistry, and uh, am happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Kelly Sexton. I'm the Associate Vice President for Research, Technology Transfer, and Innovation Partnerships at the University of Michigan. Some of you were here this morning um, for, uh, for my talk. Um, but um, before coming, uh, arriving at the University of Michigan, I was the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Technology, Commercialization, and New Ventures at North Carolina State University. And so I'm, I'm bringing the technology transfer and the university business engagement experience to the panel. Hi, my name is Brian Thompson. I'm the CEO of Elemental Enzymes. I've had our company introduced a few times today, so I won't give too much more. Um, but I think in this panel, I represent a kind of a startup who licensed from the university, but also I deal with the large companies like Corteva to kind of work in a go-between. So hopefully I can answer questions on how information from a, a small startup being the go-between between a larger company and a university. Hi, I'm Roy Hartline. I'm with, uh, I work for Bill's group in economic development um, in charge of corporate engagement um, and partnerships. Basically what I do is try and find corporate partners to come to campus and partner with the university, whether it's in research, um, technologies, um, career services even, those sorts of things. Stand by. <laughs> Like we all get a mic now, I think. So, can you hear me? Or do I need to put it up a little higher? I'm good. Talk a little louder. All right. All right. Well, so thank you uh, for being here, each one of you. And uh, I'm going to start out just with a short sort of introduction as to why is it important to hold a panel like this. And so, like I said, I think the two uh, key features of what we're going to talk about is how can the a university better partner with industry. What is the economic impacts that can come out of something like that? So, and Kelly this morning spoke about the, the land grant mission. And so, here at the university, we have four missions the research, teaching, extension, and the fourth mission being economic development. So, I feel like academic industry partnerships, in my mind, hit two of those missions really directly the research and the economic development. We also, as you may have heard from Mark McIntosh last night, if you were here, there is an ambitious goal here at the University of Missouri to double research expenditures in the next probably four and a half years now. Uh, and so one way that we can do that is by, one way that can help that uh, reach that goal is with more and more industry uh, university partnerships. We've had some successes here, Brian's company being one. We've had lots of other successes. Uh, in various ways that we partner together with industry, but we can always do more and we can get more people involved in, in, in going in that direction. So what do I mean by a partnership though? That, you may be wondering, what, it, what does a partnership look like for a university? So the faculty in the room, the, the one area that you probably think of most readily is research collaboration with industry, a very common uh, partnership. But other things that we think about in my world and in related worlds are sponsored research with an industry, funding of funding projects, fee-for-service agreements. Companies are looking for expertise from, industry, from universities as they outsource more and more R&D. So they need, that expertise lies in the university. And so we can provide that service to companies that are looking for particular projects that they need completed to help move their products and, and forward. The one that's near and dear to my heart and my 
office is license, licensing partnerships, license agreements. The university has lots of innovations. We're looking to license those out to startup companies like uh, Elemental Enzymes or bigger companies like Corteva and those sorts of industries. So those are the ways that I came up with in my mind that all those sorts of things we can mean by a partnership. And you'll hear different aspects of each of those today. What do we mean by economic impact, the other aspect of this panel? So from a university, like I said, research funding, licensing revenue, those are things that are going to help the modern research university survive going into the future. And for industry, it's bottom line, it's profit margin, it's product development, it's capital investments. These are the types of things that are important to companies. So we're trying to merge those two worlds together in this panel today, represented by the people up here. And I think in the end, for both sides, it's societal benefit and improvement. So as Kelly said this morning, the miracle work gets done here. And so, but that miracle only stays in a small miracle at a university unless it can get out to the greater public and make that miracle expand to the rest of society. So we're, those are the things we're looking at as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask some questions to the panelists. But if you have questions related to the question that I asked or whatever during in the middle, you can interrupt us and say, hey, I want to know more about what you just said. I have questions on this list, but if I don't get to half of them, who cares? We'll just throw them in the air and we'll move on. This is for you. This is to educate you, to help you take something out of this today that is going to help you build better partnerships with industry or university if you're an industry person. That's what the goal is today. So I'm going to ask specific questions to specific, specific panelists, but other panelists, if you have follow-ons to that while we're going along, feel free to add on too. This hopefully will be discussion, interaction, and so forth. So do not hesitate to ask a question. No dumb questions, okay? So first thing we're going to talk about are what are the elements that make for a good university industry partnership? And so the first question related more to the video that you saw, I'm going to pose to Roy, start close to home first, move out. So Roy, in your mind, what are the essential elements that make a good partnership with industry for academics, especially so, for Mizzou? Go ahead. Thanks, Sam. So in relation to Roche, um, just to give you a little background, we brought them on campus about four years ago. I was introduced to the chief medical officer. He was relatively new in the position. And essentially what we did is we filled a day. We talked to him prior to him coming to campus, and we did what we call a needs analysis. What did the company need that we, that we had expertise in? So we went through everything that they were looking for. And when we got him to campus, um, our relationship with Cerner at the Tiger Institute really resonated with them. So we focused on focused on that. So I think one thing is would be focus on focus on the, the company. Um, and through our experience with them, they've guided us in, in certain ways. Like um, I got an email from him. I asked him, what do they look for in in universities? Do they measure universities? And basically what he, he told me, or the Roche group told me was we look for two things essentially relationship and competence. Um, th those, are the, those are the two things that we, that we treasure, basically. If we've got a relationship and you, you, have, you have the confidence, we're, we're glad to do work with you. So, so from our end and from Roche's perspective and, and through that partnership, um, it, it's, it's based on relationship and competence. And so, again, I'm playing off Kelly's presentation this morning, but she said we need to be able to spread the message of focusing on that long-term return maybe just take a quick second and say, was that you snapped your fingers right and that relationship just blossomed and away you went, right? No. <laughs> I'm afraid not. You, we, we had to work through certain channels, obviously, at the university. Um, but with this, you know, we, we try and look at it. I, I hate the cliche win-win, but in this situation, you know, that they tried out, a, we, beta, we beta tested a new product for them. We were the first in the U.S. to have this product. They beta tested it here on, uh, on Mizzou's campus. Um, so it was a win for them because they were getting clinician feedback in our hospital and med school. Um, and it was a win for us because we were getting free equipment, essentially, and we were doing research on this equipment. So they were funding research as well. Over the last four years, I think we were upwards of $5 million in research over the last four year, years from this partnership. 
and then ultimately, it's, it's a win for cancer patients. You know, that's the ultimate goal. So, th so the, the ultimate goal is it, it's a win for cancer patients in this area and globally. So um, it's, been a really, it's been a really great partnership from, from not from the get-go, I wouldn't say, Sam, but, um, um, but... They take time. Yes, they do, they do take time, definitely. Patient. Yes. Sure. So I'm going to turn that question now to Luke, I'm from Corteva here, and say, so Luke, what are the essential elements of a good partnership with an academic collaborator from an industry perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So my role at Corteva is a strategic outsourcing director, and what that means is I'm always in, on the lookout for, for research organizations, and that can be either public or private, that have you know, capability or capacity that, that we don't have at Corteva. And, and one good example of that happened right here at Mizzou, where we engaged uh, Dr. Zhang and the Soybean Transformation Core Facility uh, and we ended up with a fabulous partnership that went over a period of five or six years. So what made that partnership fabulous? Well, number one, he had capability that we needed, and he was well recognized in industry for being a, a leader in that area. So it made it easy for us to approach him about, about the services that he was able to provide. The other thing that was unique about that one is it, it was fee for service, okay? We weren't asking the university to develop something new for us. We were asking the university to perform a task. And, and fee-for-service, while it may not be sexy, it provides a lot of very tangible benefits for both the university and a corporate sponsor like Corteva. In this instance, the partnership allowed Dr. Zhang to continue to build capability in his laboratory and capacity. Uh, ultimately, it was a project that was successful enough that it actually resulted in some publication that came out of, uh, out of developing some new capability and methods that were unique to industry, and it definitely helped Corteva. At, at that time, we didn't have the capability to do uh, soybean transformation, uh, at least well, in-house, and, and, and that served us very well in bringing some new products to market, some of which are just now hitting the, hitting the uh, corporate marketplace. But from a win-win perspective, the other tangible things that really helped is that some of these employees and, and graduate students that Dr. Zhang was able to employ because of the research we were doing were also people who gained skills, some of which got jobs at Dalgra Sciences, some of which got jobs at some of our competitors. So it really did serve multiple purposes. And, and the partnership was successful because the capability was real, the university and, and that being a core facility was open to fee-for-service type research. And, and Dr. Zhang was just incredible about saying that he was going to do something, stick into it, and just getting it done. So I think it's a good fee-for-service example. I know research collaborations can often look a lot different than that and have different goals. But for us, that was an absolutely fabulous and honestly a model relationship. So I imagine sticking to the goal was an important part of that. So I think that's a message is in terms of you, the company, were providing funds to do this. So you expected the researcher, in this case, to stick to the goal of what you wanted done, correct? That's correct. We, had, we knew exactly what, what we wanted to have done. So we had clearly defined goals, and Dr. Zhang understood those goals and committed to delivering them. At the same token, though, you have to have good communication. I can tell you from my experience in, in fee-for-service business, whether it's public or private, the number one area that places fall apart are communication, okay? If things are going, gra going great, it's wonderful to be able to communicate success. But it's research, right? I look around the room and I, I would hazard to guess that most of you are researchers and we know that research never goes as planned. And so communication of both good news and bad news are critical to a, a building a healthy relationship. And I assure you that things didn't always go well in Dr. Zhang's lab, and that was fine. He was unbelievably good at communicating both positive and negative things, and he was very collaborative about working with us to identify solutions to those problems. All right, thank you. So there, we just uh, kind of said, well, these are the good elements that make a good industry research or, or university industry collaboration, but now we're gonna flip it on the other side and say, okay, what, what are some reasons this doesn't happen well? And so what are the failure points of a university industry partnership? So Brian, I'm gonna go to you next and say, so what are the, some of the main reasons that a university industry partnership would fail to ever even get off the ground, get started? And I hate to say the kind of opposite of the, the two stories here, but... Uh, and, and Kelly, the, the tough, the tough 
Yeah. Um, one of the things that when we reach out to different universities is um, we want to pick the people who, you know, you do have faith in them. They're going to deliver. They're going to communicate. Um, and I think that when we've seen them not work out, it's been, like I said, they disappear or it's failed a long time ago and they're just trying to floundering through it. But, you know, having that realization that, you know, it doesn't work, I'd rather move on to another project. And I'm sure Cortina would rather move to a different project. I'd rather be up front and say, hey, it's a failure, let's do something else. But instead of waiting and let somebody kind of flounder. So, but just being up front and saying, you know, we threw everything we had at it. I mean, we're out of ideas. And um, I think that's something that, you know, some university people would struggle to articulate. Um, I think that's a good communication is where you can fall apart. Um, and also just competency if you don't think that that person's going to come through um, with the result. Um, but usually that's kind of in the, when you're exploring that partnership, you kind of, that's the number one thing you're looking at is, you know, are they competent? Can they provide the skill? Is this a huge stretch for them or is this something that's routine for them? Um, so hopefully you can mitigate that, but you know, that's also where you can have more confidence than actually the person could perform. So. So focus and communication, I think, are two key points here from our industry uh, panelists. And so, Kelly, I'm now turn to you. And so from a university perspective, what are some of the major factors that would cause a partnership to fall apart over time? So maybe it got started and got moving along, but something happened that caused it to fall apart. Uh, I'm going to sort of answer that question. You can definitely <laughs> adjust it if you'd like. Okay, um, so you know, kind of picking up on that point of well, the project didn't work out, so we need to stop that project, right? That makes perfect sense to a company. I can completely understand why they would want to do that. The problem is just how universities are structured, and so when we're setting up a research collaboration, what are we doing? We're hiring a graduate student. We're paying for a graduate student to work on that project, and so when if a company wants to just suddenly halt it. Well, what if they have, they're on an H-1B visa? I mean, you know, we universities have to think about these things, and we don't have this, you know, kind of flexible um, funding where we can always just move them around to the next project. We're really um, built to, you know, work with the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, USDA, stable long-term funding sources that allow us to plan for and sustain um, graduate student research projects. That's That's really how we're built, and so that might be, you know, where some of the friction comes, and, and so where I've seen things work well is when um, a corporate sponsor understands, I want to have a big relationship with this university, and I understand the university is built to educate, uh, to do research, and they're also training graduate students, and I understand if we cut a project midstream, it's going to put that graduate student in a real hardship. And we're also interested in this university's graduate students as potential hires. So where I've seen it work well is with companies that say, we may decide to reduce a project but we, that's not working out, but we will always maintain our commitment to the graduate student and to you know, sustaining you know, their research so that we're not harming their educational attainment um, or their advancement um, towards their, their PhD. So I, I think when companies understand how universities work, it can function very well. Um, I also think when um, groups of companies come together to build consortia and to sponsor research in a pre-competitive space, that can be an area where really exciting things can happen. Uh, when it's, it's an area where nobody really needs exclusivity or, or, or dominance, but they're coming together to kind of share um, concerns in a, in a particular area and together jointly fund research in that area. Um, a, a great example of, of that um, are the engineering research centers through the National Science Foundation. I think those are, are really great models. Um, you know, the, the IUCRCs bringing together companies um, with some seed funding from the National Science Foundation um, with the hope that they'll become self-sustaining entities. I've seen those really grow, up, grow and flourish because companies are there, they're sponsoring research, but they're also looking for that graduate student talent that they eventually want to hire in. So it's, it's not all about you know, having exclusivity in this one domain, it's about this long-term relationship with a university in a particular area of research. Uh, I, yeah, I agree with that. I think, I think they're looking for a holistic approach. So if we've got expertise in more than one area on campus, and they're interested in more than one area, they would invest in those areas, whether it's students or technologies or 
um, you know, or research. I totally agree. Okay. So, like I said, there, this is interactive. I don't want to deter anyone from questions. This would be, I just want to see if there's any questions at this point. We're kind of going to transition just a little bit. So does anyone have any questions, comments that they want to bring up now at this point? Going once, going twice. You guys are the symposium warriors. You've stuck it out all day. Yeah. Ask some questions. <laughs> it's yeah. fine. Anybody? No? Okay. We'll keep moving on then. So the next uh, aspect that I wanted to talk about is, so, you know, what are some strategies for advertising opportunities on both sides? So how, you know, sometimes faculty will come to me and say, well, I don't even know where to start in terms of trying to attract a partner in industry or, or, or so forth. So, you know, we want to get into more, well, how do I build these collaborations? How do I, you know, do I put an ad out on uh, NBC and say, hey, I'm a researcher and I'm looking for an industry collaboration. What's, what's the way to go about this? So I'll go to Brian first here on this one. So what tend to be the most effective ways that industry learns of the hot areas or the attractive areas of university research and innovation? Where do you go to look for that or where do you, where do you find it? Yeah. For, a, for a newer, for a, a fairly young company, you're going to be looking for these areas where you go to find them. Yeah, I, my company kind of plays the interspace between the, like I said, the, the larger companies who are our customers and the university. Um, but most of where I find out where the need for those innovation is through constant communication with, you know, large companies that they're the end customer for us. They are the ones who know what the grower for agriculture, what they actually want or what the patient actually wants. Um, and they're saying, hey, these are the needs for the market. How can we fulfill those needs? Um, so we'll get those needs. And then from my side, um, what I would a lot of times do is, like I said, I'll look at different tech transfer websites where they'll have lists of technologies and I'll try to find technologies that seem like they may fit the need and then reach out to the tech transfer office and say, okay, this one looks like it might actually fee, fit a need um, that I, but like I said, I'm, I kind of act as a middleman in some capacity because I usually, the technology on the tech transfer website can hit that need, but it usually needs some sort of polishing. And I, we look for those technologies we could take in-house, make it kind of more of a package to make it you know, ready for a, a larger company. So it's here the information from the people who talk straight to the growers, which is usually, in our case, the large ad companies, and then looking at tech transfer to try to find solutions that we can bring you know, and get them shaped so that they'll meet that need. So. That's kind of the what we play. We play in the middle. You I didn't tell him to say that. Hey, I say you further validated a point that Kelly and I talked about earlier today. My take home, one of my take home messages for me today as the tech advancement office director is that marketing your stuff on your website works. Kelly said that today, and I was like, oh man, I, I thought marketing was this like seven step strategy that you had to do all these different things, but so. One, put it on your website. That's one, put, like fishing. Yeah. Your odds go down significantly if you don't have a hook in the water. Right. So that is my take on this. Brian, go ahead. I, I will add one thing. The universities that we have a relationship with are usually the websites I go to first. So the history with the tech transfer office also affects which ones I go look for technologies first. So okay. um, that does play when you look at you know a lot of different universities. We'll go to the ones that we have some relationship with first and look at those. So you know it is you know select ones we check, and we, okay, then we got to expand our search to further outside that. Okay, very good. So, Kelly, the re, kind of the reverse of that, and you, I've already kind of answered it with my segue there, but what, but maybe other than just putting it on the website, what are some other more effective ways that you've seen at NC State or at Michigan or other places that where it, effective ways to advertise or show industry the, 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 uh, the funding needs or the the needs that you have at the university or the innovation opportunities that are available for them. So what are some ways that you go about uh, helping, you know, in your industry partner, innovation partnership aspect of, of your office and things like that? Yeah. How do you go about that? So, you know, a variety of ways. One, one way that can be, you know, simple but effective is if there's a long-term relationship with a company, if there's an existing master research agreement in place, um, having the company put together RFPs and pushing those out to faculty. Um, those are really great because, you know, the faculty knows that if they, are, you know, have an interest in that particular area and they think that they can put forth a research proposal to address that problem, that the agreement's already essentially in place. You know, they're not going to have to worry about whether the, um, you know, uh, 
sponsored research office is going to be able to come to terms with the company. They don't have to go out and find the company. The company's already, you know, uh, partnering, collaborating with the university. So that can be a really, you know, reduced friction way for the companies that are already engaged with the university in some way. Um, you know, I think beyond that, uh, many universities are realizing the need to have some sort of a dedicated business development function um, associated with the university to help be that liaison between industry and the faculty. So people whose jobs um, involve meeting with companies, finding out what they're interested in, going back to the faculty, finding the right person and helping make those connections, helping the company navigate through the university's um, research contracting office to make sure that they've got a good experience. Um, so I, I think, you know, I think companies appreciate having that one point of contact at the university they can go to and say, hey, I want to talk to this faculty member, or hey, you know, the contract hasn't gotten through yet, can you help with that? So we've, um, at both universities, um, found that to be really impactful to have that um, dedicated um, resource available for the companies to really be helpful to them and, and getting uh, connected with the university. Luke, Brian, would you agree with, with that? Well, I did definitely agree with the, the single point of contact and you know one of the things that, that we didn't get into on one of, the, one of the big problems that we have in engaging universities in research is that legal hurdle. You know being able to, to get the legal right to pick out a researcher and work with them on any type of project. Um, universities and corporations have very different objectives and therefore our legal teams look for very different things on agreements and so sometimes the for example the opportunity to publish it's very important to a university researcher but it gets in the way of of developing something proprietary and so for that reason we often that's an example of something that we often butt heads on i would say from a corteva perspective when we've engaged universities a lot of times the connection actually comes from somebody presenting at a professional conference on a technology that's interesting, or, or even people in our, our labs who read articles, right? We may, we, may not be, we may not be in the business of developing basic research, but we're consumers of it. And so our, our scientists constantly read journal articles, and when they identify a researcher who's particularly good at an area of interest, that often does lead to engagement, and especially if we can run into those people at professional conferences. The one other thing that's sometimes difficult for a university to market to, though, is, is companies like Corteva are going to identify universities that we want to build a bigger relationship with. A lot of times they're universities that are local for us, and you're from Michigan, and I'm sure that you've had a lot of interaction with Dow, right? Because Dow is a Michigan company, and Dow invests a lot of money at Michigan. And, in, in Missouri, I don't think it's a coincidence, it's, it's called Monsanto Auditorium, right? I don't particularly like the name, but <laughs> it, it is what it is. But, but, but you still. Can, you can update that for a price, I'm quite certain. I, I've been offered that before, but unfortunately <laughs> I don't have the authority to do that. So, and, and I probably would have done it at Dow, and now it would need to be Corteva, so it would just get messy. But maybe it needs to be Bayer now too, right? I, I don't know. But at any rate, th there are things sometimes outside of a, uh, out of a university's control because of geography and, and the relationship they have with companies in their state. We like to work with people who are local to us. It, it makes the research that you're doing seem next door. And, and to be honest, Indianapolis, which is where Corteva is headquarters, it's not that far away in our relationship with Mizzou was very productive because of geography. It was easy for us to get here. It was easy for us to check in things and collaborate. That's where Roche is headquartered in Indianapolis. Just okay. location, geography is it plays a big part as well. Mm -hmm. There's a reason we have a collaboration with Cerner, Monsanto. Obviously, you're you're right. So, Luke, just to follow up on that, for Mizzou specifically, is there any particular way that we should anything that we should be trying or doing better to make our research opportunities available, our innovations available to a big company like Corteva? And, or any mid-sized companies, small companies like Elemental Enzymes as well. So. Well, absolutely. I mean, it, I think, Kelly, you mentioned it, just the connections, reaching out and identifying people in our organization that you can connect with. And, and that can happen, you know, at a high level, and it can also happen at a peer-to-peer at a -peer researcher level. Every interaction matters, right? And, and the old 
saying is that it really matters who you know, right? I keep telling my kids that, you know, make sure that you shake hands when you see people, make sure that you get to know them because you never know when a relationship matters. And so communicating with researchers in companies like Corteva or Elemental Enzymes or, or any other company can result in a relationship that can bring financial benefit to your laboratory and to the university as whole. And little relationships have a tendency to snowball. It's kind of like Bill was talking about earlier about catching that wave. You just never know. I guess if you're a really good surfer, you might know which one's going to be the good wave. But for me, it'd be a random guess. And every now and then, you're going to find something that really has legs and you can make something out of. So continue to just look for all sorts of relationships. Now, corporate, corporately, you know, having, having University of Missouri interact with people at a higher level at a company like Corteva, can it make a difference? Absolutely, and, and that doesn't have to start with research. It can start with recruiting, too. Um, having people who come from Mizzou in our laboratories in Indianapolis or Johnston, Iowa, or Wilmington, Delaware, or wherever, it matters because those connections lead to relationships which lead to research. Okay. So I think, it, you know, for those in the, the Mizzou audience in the, in the crowd, you know, when you're at these conferences or you're interacting with industry, you are the Mizzou representative there, and so you are representing us all, and uh, as we all hopefully are working together to, you know, build our partnership base, just keep that in mind. I think everyone, it doesn't hurt to reiterate that message that we're, we're all representatives for our university here, and uh, you may be the only face for Mizzou that that person sees, you know, in a given time, period of time, so um, that's just something to keep in mind. I think uh, Rodolph last night talked about, you know, when talking to the public or talking to colleagues, you know, there are different mindsets and different approaches that you take. So just keep, keep in mind who your audience is, and I think that'll take us, each, each of us in the Mizzou family, a long way. So, uh, so the next uh, aspect of what we're going to talk about are something that I, I couldn't moderate this panel without talking about intellectual property and innovation specifically. So uh, it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't be me. So we're going to go a little close to my home here and, and talk about how do we, some aspects about advan advancing the innovations at the university, which can sometimes be attractive uh, vessels for industry partnerships. So I'm gonna go to Kelly first on this one. So when talking about, you know, university innovations, in your experience, what stage or level of advancement does, that, do the, does a university innovation, uh, an idea or, or discovery need to be advanced within the university before an industry partner like Elemental Enzymes or Corteva is going to be show legitimate interest. Well, you know, in some way, I think, um, you know, what I was describing this morning about how universities are using startups as conduits to take our technologies, develop them further, to make them appropriate for licensing to, to large corporations. I think, to some degree, we've kind of seen that, you know, discussed because that's exactly your what you're doing now is looking at universities taking technologies in, packaging them, developing them further, and then partnering and, and out licensing. So I, I think the, you know, the, there's not one answer. They need to be developed further than we typically are capable of, <laughs> of taking them. That's one thing for certain. Um, but I think the bar is much lower for a smaller, more nimble startup company. And I think that's why, you know, I. You know, at one point we started to look at where our marketing efforts were successful, and it was really with companies of 100 employees or less. That was where our marketing efforts were more impactful, and that's where we found it easier to license, just because they were more willing to bring in an innovation that didn't have a, you know, address a billion dollar need. They were more willing to invest in an innovation to advance it further. So I think for university tech transfer, we're going to see that it's really going to be us working with small companies and st helping to launch startup companies to bridge that gap between where our research is and where a large corporation needs to see it developed. Um, you know, I just think that's going to continue to be the trend. So I think uh, one thing I picked up on what you said there is there is really no upper limit, if you will, to where a university could take can take a technology to, to make it attractive. So if you're in your lab and you're you're wanting to help attract industry partnership, you know, taking the I'll use the football field analogy, 
you know, taking the, taking the ball to the 50-yard line, that might be great. Doesn't mean you can't take it to the red zone, you know, in terms of getting it uh, further along if that's, if that's uh, a goal for your laboratory, for your program. Yeah, taking it to the goal line. It is, but, you know, at the same time, we, we have to be, you know, we have to recognize what researchers are interested in. It's like, well, I showed this work in Arabidopsis. Now doing it in corn's not interesting. I want to go on to the next discovery. And, and so, okay, well, how do we, you know, we, we also have to meet them where they are because we're here to serve them. And I, I can't convince somebody, you know, to take that next step if it's not intellectually interesting to them and if it's not going to provide an educational value for their graduate students and all those, those other things. So, okay, well, how do we take that and can we, you know, is there an existing company somewhere that we can, you know, license this to even though it's earlier and we won't get as much value because we haven't demonstrated it fully, but, you know, maybe that's okay. Okay, very good. Go ahead, Brian. Let me add one thing to that and just kind of being in this boat <laughs> a couple times, but the if you take the proof of concept that generally a researcher will do to get an invention disclosure, it generally is not set up exactly how a large company would want it. And it's usually there's a completely separate proof of concept, which is the right experiment in the right context. So if it's an agricultural product, it needs to be in the field, on the right crop, delivered the right way. And so there's usually that missing second proof of concept. So the, the researcher probably is like, yep, it does what it does. But then it's the context of where it's used and how it's used that's really, when we look at inventions, that's usually the second part that's missing is, okay, now in an actual real world setting, when it's actually used, it's a little bit different, it's hotter, it's colder, it's you know, wetter, saltier. There's always more complex, but if you can show you work in that setting, I think the large companies would be a lot more interested because now you're like, okay, you bridged it over to my world you know, from a lab setting to a you know, a application setting. I think there's, a, there's like a second piece of proof of concept that most inventions need to kind of move it a little closer. Okay. Do you think universities should build that infrastructure to do that second piece, or do you think that's an opportunity for partnering with, you know, small companies and having them go after other sources of funding for that? Do you have any thoughts? Sorry. No. I'm just curious. Go for it. Well, I think it depends on the interest of the university. There's some of these that the university could probably finance for a small amount of money and do it relevant with information. Usually if you talk to large customers, or Cortivo usually say, this is how it actually needs to be used. Can you set it up and do it this way? I mean, I find that they're usually very clear, like here's the hurdles to actually get this thing and they'll tell you. And that, that experiment may be $2,000 and the university might go, oh, that's easy. It might be six years of work in a lab. And <laughs> that's usually what a small company is going to have to take it and do that polishing. So the extent of what that experiment is could be very small and it could just be outsourced by the university for, but it also could be a huge undertaking. And so I think it depends on the case by case basis basis on that, but like I said, I think there's a lot of cases where it is just a small proof of concept in a relevant setting to make it more attractive. Um, so. Any in audience input on that? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Any questions? Yeah, I can get you the mic here real quick. So Brian, you were here and you went through the incubator and you've got your own company now and so it, you've got a bunch of scientists that you work with. So what's the calculus in your head where you say we're going to handle it in here or it's better to go to Mizzou or Michigan or somewhere else to work with those folks? Where's the, where's the decision point come? Yeah, I usually look at my resources I have in-house. If I have experts and capacity to do it in-house, I'll just do it in house because it's you know it's fairly simplistic to say okay I need you to do something you already have a protocol you're running it if it's a new protocol I don't have the staff I don't have the expertise generally it's very expensive and time consuming to bring it in house that's usually when I'd reach out and find a university that says okay you already do this and I've done this with Mizzou quite a few times is I already know an expert at Mizzou who does this and I'll just work with them because it's cheaper and more effective and I trust their results more because they do it every day versus if we try to do it in house. Um, so it's usually I kind of evaluate our own talent and, and capacity and say, I don't have enough people, I don't have the right expertise, and then, okay, where do I go? And I said, go with my relationships, where, where are those people? So. And for the record, that's exactly how a very large corporation like Corteva does it too. We've got the in-house capability to do it. We're going to do it until we run out of capacity. Then we look for somebody else to help us out. Exactly the same. So, uh, other questions? No? That's all I have. Oh, we, we look like 
Happy to take questions. I don't know how related mine is to the very current topic, but we do find ourselves sometimes in situations where if you come up against a significant, this is not invented here sort of mentality, and that can come from, you know, um, university or small companies, et cetera, or going up to large companies where, you know, they might have, they might not have done it in-house, but have the in-house capabilities. So my question would sometimes go back to Corteva of, is there any kind of decision point or suggestions you have for small companies or universities to kind of mitigate that or, or that idea to, s to some degree? Because, you know, you're, if there's a large department that's funded well within a private institution, um, those individuals may have a hard time, you know, looking at outside sources and say, oh, that's a good idea out there because, you know, it's their, their job to some degree. So do you have my notes? Like Kelly told Brian what to say in that one question. And so that is kind of almost what I was about to ask next. Oh, so, okay. So thank well, you. I don't know. Oh, oh very good. <laughs> if I a asked it, it is very relevant. Know, probably a lot better put together than my No, question. it's very relevant for what um, you're talking about here. But, go but ahead. it's just, you know, how, how do you get over that or how do you overcome that? Well, and, and, you know, I think that's exactly where the incubator comes in. You know, I, we heard um, Bill give an example earlier where a university identified something and then it was sold to another company and maybe even to another company before somebody paid $4 billion for it, right? So what, you know, what does that entail? Well, that entails going from a really good idea and a possibility of a commercializable product to the point at which there's a practical guarantee that something has a direct use in, for a problem. So, you know, larger companies like Corteva, we're probably not going to invest in technology unless it's, it, it really has a well-defined efficacy for a specific problem that we need, okay? We have a, an internal pipeline. We have an internal process for de developing new products, and, and our products go through the same screening, okay? We do a lot of early evaluation, and we just constantly kick stuff out until we get something that looks interesting. And when they start to look interesting, they go through a whole other series of tests, and we just continually weed things out. Right? It's obvious. I think everybody can figure that out. So the same test would be applied to things that we would be interested in investing in. Have you already gone through all the steps to prove that something really works for a real problem that we need to solve? If the answer to that is yes, it can be payday. If the answer to that is no, somebody else needs to do some work before we're really probably going to invest in it. Kelly, is that consistent with your experience? Yes, absolutely. So a uh, uh, sort of variation on that, Luke, but are there any, are there any factors or, or characteristics of an innovation that would cause a large company like yours to take something a little earlier in the cycle than what we've been talking about here in the last five minutes? Is there any, any sort of decoration that it has, that something might have to make it really per perk your interest uh, earlier in this process? So we do buy early technology. Sometimes it's not even product, right? Sometimes we'll invest in a technology because it helps us answer questions about the products we're evaluating better. I'm going to struggle to come up with a good example, but, you know, basic methodology that, that you know, generates a result okay, for us that helps us evaluate other products. Those are things that we might actually invest in. Uh, but, but that's interesting, right? Because that's basically taking a technology that you have and are performing in your laboratory that some, for some reason we feel the need to be able to do it in-house. I would actually say more commonly, if you have an interesting piece of technology and you've demonstrated that you can do it well on our products, we're probably more likely to call you up in your, in your business office and say, hey, we want to work with this researcher because they have some interesting technology that we can use. That becomes a more likely a fee-for-service relationship than, than actually us buying technology. So then it gets back to your question. Is there anything that you can do to a commercializable product that would, that would make us buy it earlier in the process? We just don't do it that much. It just doesn't fit the model. There's a question back here. Yeah. So, yeah, Luke, this is a, a follow-up. You said that, um, you know, if, if they're just short of where you'd think it needs to be, that someone needs to do some more work. So if you approach somebody or even if they approach you and you decide it's short of where it needs to be to be really interesting to you, 
do you go looking for someone else who has it all the way, or do you inform them, hey, you know, here's one, two, three, the things we need before we think it's ready, or? Yeah, well, I mean, you just think about the concept of an interesting technology. What are the odds that somebody has something very similar that they're working on? So the shorter answer is, if you have a technology that's interesting to us that we are interested in taking the next step in, absolutely, we would probably be interested in either asking you to do more research or even better, probably funding additional research to help us get the confidence that the technology will deliver as it's supposed to. All right, so any other questions as we're, right now? Here's another sort of transition point in my questions to the, to the panel. So if there's any questions or concerns or comments uh, at this point, going once, going twice. All right, afternoon food coma setting in, no? Is it? No, okay. All right, so the next, uh, the next couple questions here have to do with, so what are some misconceptions? You know, some of the TV shows, The Truth unve Unveiled. What are, what are some of the misconceptions about university industry partnerships? So, Brian, I'll go to you first. What do you consider to be the largest misconception about industry partners in the eyes of the, the, in, the university world? I'll answer your question. It's a slight variant of your Perfect. question, but uh, that's all right. Um, just from personal experience, when I was working at the university and I was, you know, looking at writing SBIR grants and everything, you would read kind of the introduction to other people's publications and try to get a feel for what the industry needs, because um, you always see this, you know, people quote big big numbers. There's this many cases, or there's this many acres that are destroyed by this disease, um, and I worked. When I was just leaving the university, I was working on the assumption that most of those were kind of an accurate depiction of what the large ag companies would want. What I found was there's a pretty big disconnect on what is in the beginning of publications and what actually is in reality. And it took me a while to actually catch up to you know what the actual needs are for the large companies. And usually, they're quite a bit different. Um, but I'll, I'll just say that kind of the assumption as a scientist of what the needs are I would never have guessed what their actual needs are. And it took the direct relationships and talking to people who are in the industry to actually say, okay, here's what the actual needs in the ag industry are. And there's a disconnect of a number of years, or maybe they're just playing wrong for some of the, you know, bland sta statements that are in a lot of papers, at least in my field. Right, it takes <laughs> so a lot the, of time for those. So it took a while to actually realize what the real needs are, but now once I learned what those are, I think that I could. As, as someone who was once a grad student, it takes a while to get those publications from the or to get that, you did the research, you submitted it, you get it churned through the journal, and you know, there, there's a time gap between that and, and keeping up with the cutting edge of what's going on at a Corteva or uh, a Bayer or something like that. So that's a good point. So to summarize, the if I went to uh, Corteva and I said, oh, well, I, I read in this publication that this is a huge problem for you guys, they'll probably say, I saw that seven years ago and I'm on to this other whole topic. And so I, would, I think that's where I'd say one of the misconceptions is that there's a gap in time between that and the big companies have already usually figured it out and are on to the next disease or, you know, something like that. So. Okay. Interesting. I, I'll, I'll throw one. I, it seems like a lot of, of university researchers feel like industry has unlimited funding. I promise you that's not true. We, they're, 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 we are, we really, do, you know, we're held to budgets, we're held to investment targets. But, you know, kind of like Bill was talking about earlier with angel investing, it's kind of what we do on products. We're always taking a gamble on a product to invest money in it and, and hit a return. And unlike Bill's, it seems like we probably have a higher success rate. We're better at predicting what may be, you know, have market value. But there aren't very many of them that probably generate, you know, 10 or 100 times investment. So it's a tough business we're in. We're in a business of investing, but the, the pockets aren't infinite. Okay, thank you. So Roy, I'm going to turn to you for the sort of the flip side of that question. What do you consider to be the largest misconception or some of the larger misconceptions about universities in the eyes of the industry? Um, from my experience, I think it's, um, I think it's that we don't move quickly enough. We're not urgent. In some cases, I think we are. If we get, if you get the right people in the room um, to discuss corporate par a corporate partnership, it can move along pretty swiftly. Um, so I think that's one misconception. Um, I think two, I think a misconception on the, on the corporate part is that we don't, we're not nimble when it comes to, you know, um, the legal counsel. <laughs> um, but 
I think our, our Office of Sponsored Programs is really easy to work with. I, th I also think that um, um, I think they do a great job. I, don't th I haven't had many complaints from, um, from industry partners that we've looked at uh, as far as that's concerned as well. So um, in some instances, too, they don't think that we collaborate very well. I tend to disagree with that to some extent because I think, again, if we get the right people in the room for certain, for, for certain partnerships, we collaborate to where we, we can get something done. Any other misconceptions that any of the audience members have feelings about on that that you want to express? No? All right. Oh, we got one. No? All right. All right. So we got, we got a little more time here. So um, I will go to uh, another question here. This one for, for Kelly. This is more about the translational research aspects of, you know, we've talked about, hey, there's this gap, you know, between where the university's taking things and where big companies and the startup. And I think you hit on a little bit of this in your morning presentation, but what are some of the more effective approaches you've seen at NC State, at Michigan, and other universities for advancing those internal, those innovations, and translating them to a better position for industry attraction, whether it be to attraction to one of these companies that's 100 employees or less or, or, or even bigger companies? What are some effective strategies uh, you know, how, from anything from R and D to you know talent, the, all the parts of the engine you talked about. How do how do you find the teams? How do you find the funding? And and what are some programs that the university is putting together to to do those sorts of things to, to make that engine go a little further down the line? Yeah, I I mean I think you know that's a really important piece of the puzzle here, and I think we've kind of touched on it. You know here well. You know, if you if you approach a company, they'll often tell you what the, you know the way they need to see the technology position, and I think that is true. And I think once you once you have that information for a technology, <laughs> getting there can be can be difficult. You know, it may take a may take a lot of calls, may need to go th even through an I Corps program, do some voice of customer to really understand the landscape and understand how you can position your technology and, and what the kind of killer experiments are that you need to be able to to undertake to show that it works and to get real um, industry interest. But, but once you've identified what that is, there needs to be money for it. Um, so one program that was very impactful at, at North Carolina State University when the, the chancellor um, arrived as, as the new um, chancellor back in 2012, he said, this is important. I'm creating a fund. He used some tech transfer money to do it, but it was that was great. Um, but he said we're creating a fund. It's called the Chancellor's Innovation Fund, and it's going to be very focused funding for researchers to help address this gap. And you have to be working with tech transfer, and you have to have an invention disclosure, and you have to have you know company interest in, in the technology. That was incredibly impactful. It, it helped. Um, it showed faculty that there was a resource that they could approach, that this activity would, would be recognized and rewarded. Um, at the University of Michigan, we're very fortunate to have a collaboration with um, our economic development group, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, that funds translational research hubs across the state, um, each hub centered at a university. At University of Michigan, we have transportation and um, life sciences. Um, at uh, Michigan State, they have the Ag Biotech Hub, for instance. And these are just wonderful programs um, where we're able to attract the best uh, research from the state, help give them some funding, connect them with industry, and, and help them move ahead. Um, and it, it also serves as kind of that curation point for, well, here's some of the best ag biotech opportunities across our you know, university system. We don't have a system, but across our, our university landscape. Um, and so I, th I think programs like that, um, you know, are, are, are just really impactful. But, you know, it, finding that, that resource, finding that, you know, if it's a partnership with an economic development organization, philanthropy, but I think, you know, finding that resource is, is worthwhile. Thank you for that. So go ahead, Peter. So my question relates to, um, you know, f finding these resources and, Going back to uh, what Bill said about, you know, it used to be that companies took a lot of technology developed at universities and said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do the development work. We're gonna find out which of these can actually make a real product that's gonna help our company. And they're getting out of that game. And I'm thinking, okay, companies are 
you know, they're, they're pretty savvy here. They're pretty smart. They probably realized that they were losing more money trying all that development on the few that hit and won than they will by waiting to find out who gets something across the valley of death and then buying it. Now we're suddenly in the game of, and, and Bill is clearly believes in it. I don't think he's in the room anymore, but that we, we can do, spend this money and do this development. But I'm thinking, if the companies are losing money at it, how can the universities do well at it? I'm pretty sure, I mean, we put a lot of money into it in the last five years, and I'm nearly certain we haven't made it back. Uh, are there universities that are actually really ahead where their, their development programs more than pay for all the expenses, or does anybody know? Um, well, I can I can speak to the the program um, that you know was run at NC State, and you know there were very focused grants. We weren't putting millions of dollars in. You know the maximum grant was seventy five thousand. We had to really understand um, you know what the milestones were, and you know we saw um, you know I forget the the number of licenses and, and startup companies. It was significant, but we saw an ROI to the university for every one dollar that we allocated. And remember, we're funding, at the end of the day, funding research, right? And so that's almost never a bad thing. <laughs> um, but, but at any rate, um, for every $1 that um, was put into the program, $7 returned, either through licensing revenue or follow-on funding. And we weren't being sloppy with the numbers. We weren't counting all future funding into that PI's lab. We were very um, selective about funding that was, you know, came into their lab to further advance that technology. Um, so, I mean, I think if you, you know, and also we're supporting our faculty, we're helping them advance their, their research. So, I mean, I, I get your point. What do we know that they don't know? I think we know our faculty, and I think we know which ones are, are going to, to try to carry things across the finish line. And I, I think supporting them in their research efforts can almost never be a bad thing. Now, should we go out and spend $2 million on field trials to, you know, prove to Monsanto that this thing works? Probably not. Um, but if it's focused investments in our own faculty's laboratory, um, that's probably something worth doing. So, Jay, I hate to put you on the spot here, but so Jay was the moderator at one of the earlier panels, the Coulter program. What's that? Isn't there, I know you have a slide when you show the Coulter program in terms of the amount of dollars that the Coulter program has put into research funding here at the university, translating uh, biomedical medical device innovations and how much follow-on funding. Can you just speak to that real quick? Yeah, sure. I think um, um, off the top of my head, <clears throat> uh, we have put in around $4 million into it in the last uh, seven years, and we have brought back around $16 million in federal grants, and you know some of that uh, is subcontracted back to the university. Some of that has come back, and uh, around uh, another $6 million in industry grants and I think around two million in early stage investor funding. So that's kind of the numbers that we're looking at. And you know, a lot of that still in the pipeline, so hopefully we'll get some more money back, but yeah. Right. So kind of similar, I think, $5 for every dollar spent kind of. Yeah, culture's a great program. Right, you probably, fan. yeah. Huge fan, Yeah, I <laughs> know. Thank so you. Hopefully we can replicate that here as we go forward at the, uh, here at the University of Missouri and other arenas such as maybe the ag area as well. Sam, uh, oh sorry, I think we have a question here. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's a comment because I used to work with Roy Hartline and we, the university for seven or eight years had a program here that those of you that have been here for a long time know was called Mizzou Advantage. And the whole idea about Mizzou Advantage was to look for cross-cutting large new disciplinary connections. And so we had a facilitator for broad areas like uh, one health, one medicine, and and uh, sustainable energy, and things like that. And uh, the, the final numbers that we had was about seven million dollars actually invested in research, and over forty million dollars that turned out mostly from follow-on grants. But there was incredible return on investment uh, that uh, was sunsetted last June. So. Okay. And and I might add to that that was also at the same time that the university was involved in what what I think was termed as the research and development advisory board. And it, it, it allowed the university to reach out into the industry to bring people in. And you know, the, I think the initial concept was to say, OK, we're doing this. What else can we do to help, help make technology more interesting to industry? You know, same discussion we're having here today. What I found that forum to be exceptionally good at, it was an opportunity for the university to get, you know, you know probably 40 or 50 industry professionals undivided attention 
to listen to presentation after presentation after presentation about technology and things that were happening at Mizzou. And the one advantage was was one part of that. And you know that, that's a program that I think shut down probably four or five years ago. And, and in my opinion, that was a really good way for the university to advertise both broad capability and specific projects. So maybe we have some administrators listening online. <laughs> That up. So I have one more question for the panelists, but before I get to that, any j questions about anything we've talked about today? Uh, now's your time. You've got some esteemed folks here up on stage, so and a moderator too. So um, anybody? Okay. Well, I'm going to go to my last question then, and so that is my take-home message question or my final word, and this is for each of you, but what would be your main take-home message to the audience today, uh, members? What should they take when they leave this room, uh, take with them if they wanna, want to build effective university par or industry partnerships in their own program? So what is, what's that one thing, if they have one thing when they leave that you want them to know and, and keep with them, say, hey, if you want to build an effective partnership with industry or if you're an industry person with a university, what would you say? And I guess I'll start down with Roy and actually, yeah, we'll start with Roy. I would say it's all about relationship. If you've, if you've got a good relationship with a, with a company and you do good work initially with them, they're going to continue to support you. So I, our key, or my key anyway, where my success has come has been maintaining a good relationship with the company and doing, and doing good work here at the university for that company. All right. Brian, we'll go to you next. I, th I think one of the major things for a researcher is really it's kind of matchmaking. Um, it's trying to find out, you know, what the needs are of of your customers. If you're an ag, it's an ag company. If it's you know medical, it's a medical company. But um, being in contact with representatives and ask them, you know, especially at like conferences where you'll have kind of both the industry and university professionals there is say, what what does your industry need? And I mean, they're usually very open about, hey, this is what people are trying to solve today. Um, and saying, hey, I might have a solution for that. But just kind of presenting yourself at conf when they read your posters or they hear you talk, um, be like, what what do you actually need? And if they say, hey, I need something that does X or cures X, you'd be like, hey, I know somebody who has that. So it might be matchmaking for yourself, for your lab, but it might be matchmaking for, I know the lab down the, you know, down the hall from me is doing that. I can put you in contact with them. But it's almost working together to matchmake for people that you know their projects go... But they may be looking for something you don't have, but it might be your collaborator, your collaborator's collaborator, and just trying to say, hey, I know somebody who might be able to help you with that. But, you know, kind of matchmaking with needs, and usually it's at conferences or, you know, kind of the event that you guys were talking about earlier, a good way to get their attention. So. so I'll just jump in real quick. So I guess if I was at that conference, I might feel a little uh, intimidated. Is, is it that easy? It's just, hey, what are your needs? Is that, that the simple question that needs to be asked? Because I might say, well, they're going to look at me and go, well, aren't you more specific than that? Can't you be more specific? But is it that easy? It's, hey, what are the needs that you have at your company and, and go from there? Well, usually if you have a poster and they're looking at your poster, they have an interest that's very close to yours. So it's not just going to every single in in <laughs> professional and saying, what do you need? What do you need? It's, it's, they come to your poster and be like, this is how we addressed it and just kind of get them engaged and be like, what are you guys looking for? Is this a target you know, pest for, or is this the target disease for your group? And they say, you know, yeah, it is. And you're like, do you guys have, are you interested in more solutions? Or, you know, it's just kind of starting the conversation for the people who find you. And cause they're going to come to your poster, your talk. They obviously have at least some common ground with you, but it's not just wide open. Right. Okay. <laughs> Kelly, go to you next for your take home message for the audience. Take home message. I'd say, um, you know, if you're looking to engage with companies, tech transfer can be kind of that, that gateway and that entree. I mean, you've got, you know, people it, making sure that the people in tech transfer, the people, you know, in business development who are working with companies every day, make sure they know who you are and what your interests are. Um, you know, they're kind of your conduit to a lot of companies. They can bring, you know, companies to you if, if you, you know, let them know that you're interested in this. So I'd say be sure and take advantages, advantage of the resources that you, that you have. And I'll jump in right there. That's a good segue. So... For those of you that are at University of Missouri, uh, I think it's a good point here to just quickly say, you know, the economic development mission here at the university, we've revamped it here in the last few months. And so 
the tech transfer office or the tech advancement office has been under the economic development for a long time. But uh, under Bill Turpin, who's the new uh, leader of that, of that mission, uh, we've, we've kind of built three separate arms, tech advancement being one of those arms, uh, in this innovation and entrepreneurship, but both educational aspects and building those team atmosphere, those teams. And then Roy and Megan Jansen, who's also here in the audience, are our industry partnership and engagement team. So we're all working closely a little more. And I see Amos up there. He's on the uh, innovation and uh, entrepreneurship team. He was a panelist here earlier today. So we're all working a little more closely together. I actually meet with them more and see them, and we're, we're exchanging on what's going on. So what Kelly said is, you know, the tech transfer office, or in this case, at the University of Missouri, the economic development people that are now working together more closely, you know, you can come to me and I'm like, well, I might not completely have the answer, but I'm now working with Roy and Amos and people like that more closely that I can help you find those answers through what I'm doing. Or they, if, if, if you come with an intellectual property question to Roy, he knows that he can bounce that over to me. And so we're, we're streamlining these things a little more and more here at the university. So we're trying at the University of Missouri to be more responsive to those sorts of things as we, as we move forward. So. so Luke, I'll come to you. I guess you have the last word here uh, in terms of your take home message for those who want to build partnerships with industry. Yeah, so I mean, everything that everybody else said is, I, I thought it was good when you went to the other side of the table first, but they took all my answers. But Sorry. the one they didn't take though is, if you're a researcher in your laboratory, don't assume that you have to have the next big product or the great big idea that's going to you know that's going to be a billion dollar product. Remember too that industry is also out there looking for services, okay? If your laboratory has unique capability, understand what it is, think about how that can be applied to commercialization of a product and then use those relationships that hopefully you're also developing to say and, and make yourself open to to doing work for a corporate sponsor like like Corteva, okay? Whatever that capability is that you have, like maybe Dr. Zhang and Plant Transformation. He didn't have a new product for us, but he had a great service that meant a lot to development of our products, okay? So remember there's the service element of this too. Um, and when you have interesting service elements, that's a tricky one though, because there is tech transfer that's designed about getting technology out to industry but I don't know of too many forums that help you identify customers who might be interested in using the services that your, that your laboratories might be able to provide. And you know that almost plays out more like a grant than anything else. We're helping fund grad students and things like that in your laboratory by doing work for us. So don't forget about that element of it too. When you do that, charge appropriately. <laughs> Would be my final word. I, she said or not. Services. That these are valuable services, and we often underestimate the cost that went into building this infrastructure we have. Absolutely. Any other questions from anyone? Uh, comments? Anything? If not, I am very thankful to all four of you for coming here today and sharing your expertise and your insights into this topic. Uh, I'd, I'd ask you to. Join with me in thanking our panelists for today. Thank you. Sam.